Thank you. I just have to say I have been blessed just being here with y'all, or back with you, I should say. You sometimes don't know what you've got until you're gone, and you turn around and look at it and you miss it. And I tell you people, I miss you desperately. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you just need to pray about that. <laughs> You know, this morning we had a rather unusual woman of the Bible as our subject. And tonight we're going to use another unusual Mother's Day text. So hang in there with me and I think you'll leave with some new understanding. You know, we talked about Bathsheba this morning. And what was her son's name? Did it in- Thank you. Now, tell me again, what was her son's name? Solomon. Solomon. <laughs> Somebody had to say it. <laughs> Now, to put this story into context, we need to understand that uh, shortly after Solomon had become king, he went to a place called Gibeon to offer a sacrifice to God. And while he was there, he had a dream where God appeared to him and offered him anything he wanted. Anything. Now, suppose God appeared to you and made the same offer. He said, Bob, you can have anything you want. You name it, and it's yours. What would you request? Some of us might say we would like a better job. Some of us might say we'd like a bigger house, a nicer car. Maybe we'd like to drive a Porsche or something. Some of us might want more money or a happier marriage. But there are probably a lot of good requests that you could make, and many of them would be valid. But listen to how Solomon responds in 2 Kings 3.9. He says, please make me wise and teach me the difference between right and wrong then I will know how to rule your people. If you don't, there is no way I could rule this great nation of yours. 1 Kings 3, 12 through 13 says, so I'll, is what God answers him, and he says, so I'll make you wiser than anyone who has ever lived who, or who ever will live. I'll also give you what you didn't ask for. You'll be rich and respected as long as you live, and you'll be greater than any other king. God not only gave him what he asked for, but he went above and beyond. You got to kind of love that, don't you? And so Solomon goes back to Jerusalem and he throws a feast for his entire court. And now we go to our our text for tonight from 1 Kings 3, 16 through 28. I don't have Desiree here tonight, so you're going to have to listen to me tell it. Now two prostitutes came to the king, Solomon, and stood before him. And one of them said, my Lord... This woman and I live in the same house. I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone and there was no one in the house but the two of us. And during the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. And she put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. And the next morning, I got up to nurse my son and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. And the other woman said, no, the living one is my son, the dead one is yours. But the first one also insisted, no, the dead one is yours, the living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. And the king said, this one says, my son is alive and your son is dead. Well, that one says, no, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king and he gave an order, cut the living child in two and give half to one and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive and filled with compassion for her son said to the king, please my lord, give her the living baby, don't kill him. But the other said, neither I nor you shall have him, cut him in two. And then the king gave his ruling, give the living baby to the first woman Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Now that is a classic Bible story. But you know one of the problems with classic Bible stories is that we so often learn the basic lesson but fail to see the rest of the story. 
Now we know the basic lesson is that God uses this incident to show that God had given Solomon the wisdom he had requested as king. It shows that wisdom comes from God. But this story also provides us some thoughts of being a mother from a very different source, the two prostitutes. A good mother loves her children, and the mothers had no witnesses here to corroborate either one of their testimony. If they had, normal due process would have taken place. But because it was the word of one against the word of the other, the matter was brought to the king. Solomon had been given discernment by God to govern his people and to distinguish between right and wrong. That's what he had asked for. The first test of this newfound wisdom was here, at hand, at this moment. And do you remember the old TV show called To Tell the Truth? Anybody remember that show? You know, you, the, the story kind of reminds me of that show. At the beginning of the show, a statement was read by the host that was absolutely true for one of the people that were questioned. And there was a panel, and the people on the panel questioned the people, and then at the end, you know, they said, well, the real? And I, it kind of reminded me of that, these two saying that that was their son, and he was trying to figure this out. But the goal was to determine of this game show who was telling the truth and who was lying, and that's not too much unlike what was happening right here in this story from 1 Kings 3. Don't tell me things in the Old Testament aren't relevant to today. Two women, both claiming to be the mother of one baby, and it fell on Solomon to figure out who was being truthful. And his plan for doing so was brilliant. He ordered that the child be cut in two so that each woman would receive partial satisfaction. Of course, the real mother was what? Quick to reveal herself, wasn't she? When she was willing to give up her son alive rather than to see him die, she revealed herself simply to be the mother by the love she had for that child. Now, we all understand that there's no such thing as a perfect mother. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's the perfect mother. Nobody had the perfect mother. Nobody is the perfect mother. She's never been born never been invented, never existed. As close as we're going to get is maybe Mrs. Cleaver, Beaver's mom. <laughs> and I'm not saying this to make any mother feel bad, but to make them feel better. No one's perfect, not one of us. We all make mistakes. We all do things we shouldn't do. We all say things we shouldn't say. My mother used to say things to me and I'd say, I'm never gonna say that to my kids. <laughs> my kids aren't here, but they would tell you I probably said it. But that said, for many of us, no one is more caring, no one is more conscientious than our mother. And we need to treat our mothers with more caring and tenderness than anyone else in our lives. But sometimes we're too hard on them. And at other times, they're too hard on themselves. We've all done it. We've all questioned what we're doing with our children, even after they've left the nest. Now think about it. The two mothers in this story were prostitutes. Their babies were evidently conceived under sinful circumstances. It makes you stop and think, why is this in the Bible? Why would Solomon even care? Solomon, who was king over God's chosen people, why would he even take the time to worry about two prostitutes? These women and the sinful men who paid for their services weren't exactly living in God's will, but Solomon was concerned. He was very concerned about these two women and this child because God was concerned about them. Now we know that the church stands for purity, and the, but the church should also stand for forgiveness and restoration. We recognize these women were not living up to God's ideals and yet he still loved them. If any of us had to wait for God to love us based on our performances, we would be out of luck. These women had problems, but you know, God has answers for a mother's problems. God has answers for all of our problems. Don't look for a stress-free life. And if you're a mother, you know there's no such thing as a stress-free motherhood. It doesn't exist. Take my word from, for it, from the pains of giving birth 
to the pain of the empty nest, to grandchildren and beyond. Motherhood is stressful. I tell my daughter all the time, if I knew my grandkids were going to be so much fun, I'd, I definitely would have had them first. I could have sent them home with someone. I don't say this to discourage anyone because there's good news. God is willing and able to assist us with all of our problems. Moms, you got a problem with your kid, get on your knees. Talk to God about it. Let God help you through the problems that you are encountering, but even more so with the problems they are encountering when they're not with you. Once again, I don't say this to discourage anyone, but to encourage you. God didn't give Solomon wisdom so folks would stand around and, and uh, at the palace and say, ooh, ah, you know, like we do at the fireworks. He gave him wisdom for a purpose. God not only loved these two prostitute mothers, but he also loved that little bitty baby boy that's in this story. God gave his wisdom to Solomon to save that child. God has wisdom to spare for our parenting today, for our lives today. God can guide and provide for each one of us in all kinds of life situations, all kinds of moms. Be you a regular mom, a single mom, an adoptive mom, a stepmom, and even spiritual moms. You name it, God can give you guidance and provide for you as you deal with these children in your life. And so many times when we say children, we think children. But you are all children of God. A lot of you wouldn't be here if a godly mother, grandmother, spiritual mother, neighbor mother hadn't brought you to this place in time. Kids today have different needs. And people say that all the time. Things are different now. It's harder now. But you know what? That's okay. God has the wisdom to give you for every task you encounter. He can teach you what to do and what to say in every situation. Kids today are different. Technology alone has changed things. But we are the parents, and God can give us the, the intelligence to deal with everything that they come into contact with. In this story, what we see is that there's nothing like a mother's love. The real mother in this story would rather give up her child than see it split in two. Most of us know that. We have to be willing to give up things to be a good mother. Personal sacrifice is a pivotal part of motherhood, and it begins by sacrificing our own bodies, by carrying the child around for nine months. Our mothers fed us, nourished us, protected us with their own bodies before we ever saw the light of day. Now, I don't know anyone else who loves me enough to carry me around for nine months. Only my mother did that. But a mother's sacrifice doesn't end there. Here was a woman who was willing to give up everything for her child, her time, her pride, even her child. And we all know that raising kids requires sacrifice, right? Financially, have you all heard how much it costs on an average to feed, clothe, and educate a child? An article in U.S. News started off this way. To examine, in coldly economic terms, a parent's decision to have children is widely thought to be in bad taste. A child, after all, isn't precisely akin to a consumer product, such as a dishwasher, a house, a car, a personal computer, any one of which, of course, is cheaper to acquire and usually easier to return. According to the Center for International Statistics on Social Development, in 2000, the cost to raise a son to the age of 18, listen to this, was $159,927,000. And it was $158,826,000 for a girl. 
Now, when I first looked at those figures, I didn't understand why more for a boy. But then I looked at the breakdown and realized that the extra food required by a teenage boy was greater than the extra clothing required by a teenage girl. That was in 2000. Today, it would probably be closer to 170. That's a house, nice, nice, nice house, two BMWs, eight to 10 Harleys, and that's before they ever go to college. But the sacrifice doesn't end there. We make sacrifices of our time, of our energy, and for the most part, they think you enjoy getting up at 5 a.m. for a feeding or to get them to practice and that you enjoy waiting up until midnight or later to make sure they're getting safe and that they are sound and in their bed asleep as they should be. And for the most part, we're willing to make that sacrifice. And it's those sacrifices that make us parents. South African writer Nadine Gordimer said, there is no moral authority like that of sacrifice. And mothers know that. How many times have you heard this on TV as the moral trump card of a TV mom? After all I've done for you, carried you for nine months, I was as big as a house, my feet swelled up like bedroom slippers, do you want to see my stretch marks? And then, and then, you want to break my heart and go out tonight when I want you to stay home. Well, just go ahead. Just go ahead and break my heart. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. <laughs> but our woman in this story was willing to make that ultimate sacrifice. She was willing to give up her child to keep him alive. She would give up her opportunity of being a mother for her child. That's what set her apart from the other woman. With the other woman, it was all about her. She wanted what she wanted. Regardless, she was more than willing to only take half that child. And finally, she was willing to go to a higher power. The real mother was more than willing to go to the king to get her son back. Do you take your kids to a higher power? Not the king, but rather God. Do you pray for your children? Do you pray over your children? Do you play, pray with your children? I have a confession to make. We, um, Steve and I have not been good at family devotions through our time in you know, we've only been married a few years, though. And I hope that didn't just destroy your image of the perfect pastoral family. We've tried, and we could do it for a while, but with three daughters and teenagers and running in and out and everything that was going on, it just got tough. And we never, it just seemed like we had a hard time getting it all together. So, and, you know, they were in and out at different times. It was kind of like trying to have family dinners sometimes. Now, I know that's no excuse. But it's the truth. But we do pray for our kids. Steve prays for them when he has quiet time with God. I pray for them when I have my quiet time with God. We thank God for who they are. We ask God to protect them and be with them. And we ask God to draw them close to him. It's not always an eloquent prayer. And sometimes it's a rushed prayer. But we pray for those kids every day. We now have grandkids that we are including in those prayers. When the girls were growing up, we prayed for the men that would come into their lives that would become their husbands. And for those of you on Facebook, you know that my youngest baby girl got engaged this weekend while I was out of town. She will hear about this. <laughs> this new son-in-law already has something to make up for. We ourselves... We don't have what it takes to be a good parent, but God does, and he can give it to us. He can give it to you. If you aren't praying for your kids, then you need to start. And at the same time, pray that God will make you a better parent. James, the brother of Christ, tells us in the letter he wrote in James 1.5, if you need wisdom, 
If you want to know what God wants you to do, ask him, and he will gladly tell you. He will not resent your asking. And what parent doesn't need wisdom? Somebody said that a child is carried in its mother's womb for nine months. Somebody does not know that a child is carried in its mother's heart forever. Somebody said it takes about six weeks to get back to normal after you've had a baby. Somebody doesn't know that once you're a mother, normal is history. Somebody said you learn how to be a mother by instinct. Somebody never took a three-year-old shopping. Somebody said being a mother is boring. Somebody never rode in a car being driven by a teenager with a driver's permit. Somebody said good mothers never raise their voices. Somebody never came out the back door just in time to see her child hit a golf ball through the neighbor's kitchen window. Somebody said you don't need an education to be a mother. Somebody never helped their fourth grader with math. Somebody said you can't love the fifth child as much as you love the first. Somebody doesn't have five children. Somebody said a mother can find all the answers to her child when it rearing questions in the books. Somebody never had a child stuff beans up their nose. <laughs> Somebody said the hardest part of being a mother is labor and delivery. Somebody never watched her baby get on the bus for the first day of kindergarten or get on, in their car packed with stuff to go away to college. Somebody said a mother can stop worrying after her child gets married. Somebody doesn't know that marriage is a new son or daughter-in-law to a mother's heartstrings. Somebody said a mother's job is done when her last child leaves home. Somebody never had grandchildren. And somebody said, your mother knows you love her, so you don't need to tell her. Somebody isn't a mother. Today is Mother's Day, and we honor moms for all that they do, for all the giving they do. They remind us of God who is sacrificial and giving. God gave his only son for a world of wayward children. That kind of love should not go unnoticed and unappreciated. So respond to your mothers with great love and appreciation and respond to your heavenly father who created those mothers and motherhood in the same way. As far as we know, the apostle Paul never married and never had children, but this could be the cry of a father or mother. And here's God's word for you today, Mother's Day 2016, 2 Corinthians 4.8. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed and broken. We are perplexed, but we don't give up and quit. We are mothers. We are stronger than that. We are God's people. We don't give up. We continue on the battlefield that he has set for us. We head out of this place and we reach the people in our community. We do what God has called us to do. When my girls were off to college and, and living in different areas, they were spread across the country, and people used to say, how's your girls? And I'd say, they are great. They are walking with the Lord. They are healthy, and they are happy, and what more could I ask for? They might not have been making the best money, they might have broken their cars down several times and I've had to give them my charge card to help pay for it. They might have not been in the perfect place at the perfect time, but they were walking with the Lord and that was more important than anything else. Our children are being lost by the dozens and a lot of that has to do with technology in the schools. And it's time that we take it back. So those of you who are mothers today, those of you who are fathers, those of you who are grandparents, you need to reach out to the children, not just the ones that you've birthed, but the ones that you pass in the hallways, the ones you see at Walmart, the ones you see in your neighborhood. 
and let them know that God loves them, that there's a better life out there than what they're seeing. I don't know about you all, but I don't even watch the prime stations much on TV anymore because what they're showing is not the kind of life I want for my kids or my grandkids. It's time that we take our country back. I don't know how to tell you to do it except to set an example each and every day for the people that you come into contact with, but especially the children. Let's pray. Almighty, most holy God, we just come before you today and we thank you, Lord. I especially thank you for the opportunity you've given me to come here today for Mother's Day. Father, many of us sitting here today don't have a mother on earth anymore. They've come, gone to be with you. But I know, Lord, that they are, they did their best and they raised their children right. And they're looking down on their grandchildren and great-grandchildren and we're all struggling trying to figure out how are we going to do this. I listen to some of the things my own granddaughter brings home from school and I think, where did this ever come from? How did this ever happen? And I know it was because we, we were just too quiet. So, Father, I just ask that you give us boldness, that we step forth and, and, and actually proclaim that which we believe that we reach out to the children, that they are able to hear what it is that you have taught us, that we are able to change the path of our nation, one child at a time. I thank you, Lord, for everything you've given us. I thank you for the people who are here tonight. And I just ask that you bless them, Lord. Bless them with boldness. And I ask that you be with us through this evening, Lord, as we go from this place, put someone in our, just someone in our path, that we are able to let them know that God loves them and there's a better way. Yes. I praise you, Lord, for all that you have provided, and I ask that you be with us, Lord, as we close this service. In your son's most holy, precious name and all God's people said, amen. amen.